Hello, everyone. It's Kate Stillman with Yoga Healer and Yoga Health Coaching, and I'm here with Crystal Hosha, Courtney LaCava, and Shannon McCall, all of which are yoga health coaches and have a background in yoga um, or Ayurveda or, or both. And the question came up in, in terms of mental health and Ayurveda and the habits of Ayurveda and the doshas and what's going on right now as we're all experiencing around us a, a massive rise in mental health um, diseases or disorders or, or simply symptoms uh, in, in people around us uh, due to really due to the due to the pandemic, due to the world changing, due to um, many things that are happening in the world uh, all at once of what might seem like an unstable political climate. Uh, and there's just a lot of there's a lot of stress. And so, Crystal, why don't you just, you know, why don't you just you guys when you start to talk, just give us like a quick like 20, 30 second background and then um, you know, why this conversation now? Yeah, so I, um, I'm a single mother, I'm a yoga teacher and a wellness pro. I've been studying Ayurveda since I was about 17 and really feeling it deep in my body um, throughout a lifetime of also uh, working with anxiety and depression symptoms. And so through that experience, through implementing the Ayurvedic habits and also going through those experiences with mental health, I see a lot of potential for Ayurveda to do a lot of good in a world where um, the medical establishment, I think, just can't really understand the subtlety of mental health. Um, and so that's why I'm inspired to talk about this with you guys today. Great. Shannon? Uh, yeah, I'm also a longtime yoga teacher and I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner. And I come from a family with a lot of mental health issues, which was one of the things that really pushed me towards looking at like, what, where is healing in the culture and what can I do to live a happy life and also to prevent at that time in the eight, early 80s, it was like, I didn't know if this was like part of my genetic this is just what was going to happen to me, or if I actually had some choice about it. <clears throat> and in terms uh, of symptoms you were experiencing then? I, I wasn't experiencing symptoms, but I was concerned for my future. I was a young woman and I thought, oh, is this, is this where I'm heading? Am I heading towards addiction? Am I heading towards mental illness? You know? Um, so what can I do to strengthen myself and, and prevent this, if anything? <laughs> this is from the point of view of a young 19-year-old, right? Not, not, um, not a lot of sophistication and how I but could think thinking, at that time. Forward thinking yeah. 19 year old. Definitely. And, and that's right. Recognizing that there was choice. And, and um, you know, I have a family member with bipolar who finally wrote a book about how she overcame bipolar. It, it's, it's a book on Vata balancing. It's a book on Dinacharya. Mm -hmm. It's a book on routine and structure. You know, it's like, did she have bipolar? Does she have bipolar or does she have high Vata? You know, could she have prevented going on meds had she been able to uh, learn and, and implement Dinacharya or were those meds just something she needed you know so those questions are so interesting to me great and, and Courtney um excuse me a little bit nervous my anxiety is up here a little bit <laughs> I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner. We're just talking to each other. I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner and yoga health coach as well. And I've been practicing yoga for 20 years, Ayurveda for 13 years. And so my background was I had a pretty severe case of chronic fatigue over in my late twenties. And through that I had a lot of anxiety and depression. And so that's basically how I discovered Ayurveda. And I see that, um, just through the people that I work with, the patterns that are coming up and in terms of feeling like there's something that's, this is just how I am and there's this pathology that's stuck rather than really feeling empowered with what we can do. And I think for me, that was my huge um, awakening with, with Ayurveda was realizing that I actually had this tremendous power to shift my mind, shift my emotions, shift my physiology through my habits and through my daily practices. Um, and really seeing the bigger connection between my own physiology and the natural world. And, and through that, not seeing my own health as something that was just kind of these just disjointed parts, but really the bigger picture of um, how I live my life, how I flow through my day, how I flow through my relationships, and how I really tap into my deeper potential through these habits and through these practices. Yeah. So I think the, I mean, what we do as yoga health coaches is coach people through 
rhythm, through habits, through, if you have most of these habits, most days, not perfectly, but most of these habits, most days you have a much greater likelihood of a positive mental, emotional body, a, a healthy physical body. You have more access to your intuition and you have more access to that inner alignment of, of a life of deeper meaning, right? Like all of, and that's what the, these habits out of yoga and Ayurveda arose over just an observation that's been going on for literally thousands of years of saying like, this tends to work, right? This tends to work. It doesn't matter if you're Vata or Pitta or Kapha, what your, what your body type is, what your metabolic type is, what your blood type is, what your ethnicity is, what country you're from. This tends to work for Homo sapiens um, in these very simple habits of like, eating when the sun's out as opposed to when it's dark out going to bed on a going to bed on a on an empty stomach as opposed to a full stomach waking before the sun rises so that your awareness is attuned to the subtlety that happens before the dawn and witnesses the upliftment the inspiration of the dawning of a new day uh moving your breath to move your body so that you have a, a coordination between the life force energy or oxygen or prana and how that circulates through your body and creates a, a coordinated experience, which seems to have a parasympathetic effect on the nervous system, which relaxes you for the day and the challenges ahead so that then you can get on with your day. Right. And like just a quick overview of like, that's more or less the game we're playing here as, as yoga health coaches. So let's talk about like how, how much an effect, just the habits have on mental health, whether it's anxiety, depression, uh, chronic uh, irritability, critical nature, or anger patterns, uh, how, like regardless of someone's patterns, like how much, how much do we notice the habits make a difference? Oh, it's, it's huge. I mean, in everybody that I work with, um, I mean, just knowing that there's something you can do. <laughs> I mean, that, that alone, just notice knowing. So some people don't really understand that yet. They don't know that through their own actions, they can influence how they feel. So for somebody who's been living with chronic anxiety, to understand that she could actually calm herself down by rubbing a little oil on her hands and feet in the evening is like a total game changer. And I think there's also, I love the light bulb metaphor, which is, um, I can't remember who, 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 who says this, but I, um, it's basically the idea of like the current being vata or prana, the light being more tejas or that pitta element, and then the, the actual glass being like ojas, which is the container that, that keeps our mind and our physiology stable and steady. And so when we invest in these practices that build up the stability in our mind and our body, if we invest and align ourselves every day and recognize the power to do that through simple practices like when we wake, when we eat our meals, when we go to bed at night, and then continue to do that, the repetition of that, that we're able to build up this container, build up this stability. So we can focus less on the specifics of what's going on in the mind and the emotions, and we can focus more on what we actually have the power to do. Like Kate, you talk about choice points. Like where are my choice points? When we feel that we are kind of at the mercy of where our emotions are, where our mind is, we recognize, well, these are the small choice points I have during the day. I can make myself a nice nourishing meal or rub oil on my feet or do an oil massage or go to bed early. Um, and, and so I think that that ability to create the stability in OJAS, that vital energy, that cohesive quality in the body and mind is really where the power lies. Yeah, I absolutely ditto that. And I love that you use the word container because that's exactly how I experience the, the habits in my life um, personally and how I teach them is that we're creating a container in which we can be safe, whole, and cohesive. And by creating that foundation, it, it puts ground where there wasn't one. So in the case of anxiety symptoms or a sense of vada, you know, things, things are going out, you know, everything's going out, you're blowing out, energy's being dispersed. And once you get that foundation, um, it, it gives you an orientation. You don't even know where, where up and down was before necessarily. And once you get that foundation of those habits of, okay, like now I have a structure where every day I can see my progress within this structure and you can map it, you can track it and you can be in touch with it in that way and kind of point yourself in the right direction. That's kind of my experience of it personally. 
Yeah. So what I'm hearing what you're all saying is like the more understanding one has that there's things that one can do to feel better, to align, uh, that will have an effect on, on the mind that will have an effect on the emotions and, um, and the physical body, then, then there's, there's hope and there's potential for aligned action. And what I'm also hearing is, is that the accumulation of aligned action has big payoff, right? So it's not, it's not like here, pop a Xanax, it's, uh, do these things over, over time and you'll gain a greater foundation um, in which to experience yourself amidst the chaos of the world or whatever's happening there, that we can't, what we can't control and what's beyond our control will actually be more in right relationship with. Whereas the more chaos we have in our own daily habits where that meets the chaos of, of the world and politics and COVIDs and people that are beyond our control that like yesterday I was in the grocery store and there was like fight in front of me, like, to and I live in a like rural town where I was like, wow, you know, like how grounded am I will determine <laughs> whether I pick any of this up or not this really weird negative energy around me. Right. So the chaos of the world, things we can't control, uh, we can, and this is what we're really saying here is we, we have just some big levers to pull in, in controlling our experience. And, and this, this is kind of where, you know, compound interest comes in or, or like the, you know, the idea of like what we, we can't prevent what's happening right now, but we can prevent what's going to happen in the future. So not only are we investing in how I'm feeling in this moment, but I'm investing in how I'm going to feel in 10 years. And that, I mean, if you're looking, if you're a 40 year old woman looking at menopause in 10 years, like that's a fabulous investment because that means, you know, you can count on having a much smoother transition. Yeah. So, or if you're 70 looking at 80 or 80 looking at 90 or 90, yes. looking, right. It's like, wow. It's like, it all ends in death. Right. So like, how do we want to, how do we want to go out? Uh, great point. And I think the other piece too, about like creating that container is that within that container, there's that space. And I think that when we create this structure with our habits, we allow for a greater space within which like Kate, you had talked recently in a, in a call about space allows for digestion. And we have so many emotions coming up right now. We're all kind of going, going through this collective trauma like we've never experienced before. And so being able to really sit in that space and allow those, allow ourselves to just feel what's coming up without trying to change it, without trying to even name it, but just to really sit with it and to be in our breath and to allow for a digestion of our experiences and our sensory impressions and our emotions will help us to prevent that kind of going into the body on a deeper level and affecting the mind and the physiology on a deeper level as well. Yeah, and I want to highlight what you said about be in our breath because for what I've, what I've noticed, um, and I have read a bit on this about like if someone really is in an anxious or depressed state to be in the emotion can, um, can just create a negative feedback loop. So it's like, how do we also help someone that's in a sympathetic nervous system response where they're having an, basically a reaction to life uh, shift? And from, from, from yoga, many of us are trained in that, like if you, if you can't get there from the mind alone, use the breath to shift the mind. If you, right? if you can't just shift your emotional body with uh, intention or thought, facilitate this with, with the breath. And, and so we have the practice of pranayama of just moving breath. And I would say for people who can't get there with the breath, that's where we have asana right. or the physical postures of like, okay, let's reach up, touch the sky and exhale, touch the earth and inhale, touch the sky and exhale, touch the earth. So we can start to you know, open and close or pulsate with the pulsation of the universe to gather all our cells together in a pulsating harmony, which creates the relaxation in the nervous system, which is like, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. And arising from that space that we create is a frame of reference for who we actually are, like where we end and where the rest of the world begins. So speaking of going back to, you know, your grocery store experience, and am I going to pick this up and am I going to take this with me? through creating that space, we can actually see our boundaries and we can, we can choose like, okay, I have a boundary here. I'm not going to take this on. I'm not going to, um, let this in and we can digest our experiences more easily. Yeah. All right. So 
the other, you know, this is something that I was talking with Winston about last night is like, who are, who are paying attention to? Like, what are, what are the triggers of our mental, of our mental health? So in yoga, in, in the yoga sutras, it's pretty clear early on in the yoga sutras, it's ancient yogic text, uh, which kind of like the Bible is more of a, of a collaboration than like an, an individual contribution. So we have this collaboration of yogis over time who one text goes to another text and then the yoga sutras come in a couple thousand years ago is like, this is a good one of pulling together uh, what we know about yoga to, as of 2000 years ago. And like right off the bat, it's like, you control your mind and your mind is gonna to have tons of fluctuations. So you better rein in what you're pointing your, your mind to. And to me, this is very important in terms of mental health and it's very important in terms of what's going on today. Cause if someone's addicted to, their, uh, to checking the news on their cell phone or checking social media on their cell phone and they don't have very careful filters in terms of where they're sourcing either social or news from, uh, they're inviting maybe more chaos and then they can actually control in their own mind. So someone who has like a lot of stability in your mind, you can take on a lot of the chaos in the world. You can take on a lot of like fights in the grocery store and negative impulses from news and check COVID stuff. Like you can, you can, you can digest a lot to go back to Courtney's uh, space analogy of like how much, can, how much space do you actually have to digest the stuff that's coming in <laughs> that you're bringing in through your senses, including what you're looking at on your screen. So I've noticed with COVID two, uh, two different schools of thought, I would say coming from the left. So I'm just gonna start there. So, so those who tend to be more looking at multiple sources um, as opposed to dogmas, let's kind of <laughs> summarize it that way. And what I notice is, you know, the, A, this virus is really, this virus is really petrifying because there's all these mutations and we're as humans uh, really in chaos with this one and therefore we should protect, 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 protect. So I'm noticing that as, as A, uh, and then I'm noticing B, more of the evolutionary biologist community being like, you've been adapting for you know, 3.5 billion years in cellular form. And the mindset of I, you are strong, you are adaptable. So align your awareness to that, to the dynamicism of evolutionary biology. Uh, and, and I just noticed that those two different schools of thought one st stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which means that I'm in fight or flight, which means I'm anxious or depressed. The other stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is I'm, I'm old, I'm, I'm beyond time, uh, I'm adaptable, I'm okay. And to me, the choice making around that, it doesn't mean I'm not going to protect myself and others, from me, right? But it, it's a very different operating system to inherently be running. Um, and it's like, you have to really go over after information like that to be able to like pull it in. Uh, it's not gonna show up on your news feed or your social feed, uh, most likely. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that if I, I think about that a lot because I feel like if, if I didn't have this background and this wisdom of, of Ayurveda and know and feel empowered, like when this hit, um, in my family, I have two little boys and I'm married and granted, you know, we have a lot of, of privilege. We have a lot of good things in our lives that protect us. So I understand that everyone's in the situation. We were like, okay, we, we felt innately like there are things we can do rather than, oh my gosh, we're completely at the mercy of what's outside of ourselves. And so our fear and anxiety didn't, didn't skyrocket because we felt empowered to have certain tools and a certain perspective about how um, our body works and what we can do should something come up. And kind of also a, a spiritual perspective of like the bigger picture of it as well. Yeah, and I think that brings up kind of fundamentally for me what anxiety is, is kind of a lack of trust the way I experience it personally. And so whenever I can go back to that mindset of I am ancient, my body is strong, my, you know, my mind can settle. The thing that I am inside is essence. It's not fear. Um, that's when I'm able to really touch on that sense of trust. And so for me, you know, I'm young and I'm more or less robust in my health and my immunity. I've been, you know, taking good care of myself. I haven't had COVID fear as far as um, worrying about contracting it, 
of course, you know, there are the concerns of, you know, you don't want to give it to anybody else. But for me, it's the whatever anxiety has arisen during COVID is, is a lot more about the state of the world and more like ecological grief, maybe, let's say. Um, and of course, the fires. Well, how is that, that are different happening. then? Like, so it's faith, right? So there's still, like, why? So COVID didn't shatter your faith, but these other things did, right? But isn't it the same? <laughs> it's the same mechanism, right? It is the same mechanism. And so I think the story jumps in and tries to override. It tries to kind of steal the show again. You know, yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to find the way that it can find a foothold. But really, it comes down to that trust in the resilience of, of human beings and the resilience of nature and our adaptability and our interconnectedness. Because we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll find a way. And we're going to, you know, especially people who are having these conversations. And so COVID happening, all, you know, fires happening are making these conversations much more relevant to the mainstream. And actually, it gives me much more hope than I could have had when I was younger, let's say, when no one cared or was listening, you know? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's another key part of the conversation I find myself returning to, which is we can, to, to an extraordinary degree, like just like, to, like the yogis point out, like to an extraordinary degree, we can control our mind. To an extraordinary degree, we can control the amount of inflammation in our body. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's very much connected to what's going on in our mind because we know that the more we're in anxiety or depression, the more inflammation there is going to be in our body. Uh, and so with this, why is that important? Because the more inflammation in our body, the more broken our immune response, the more uh, danger any virus uh, or pathogen of any sort or really incident, negative incident of, of any sort will, will pose to the breakdown of our physiology, which the immune system is trying to protect. So the, again, like the core conversation to me in the world should have everything to do with how do you stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system and how do you start to live from that operating system? Mm -hmm. um, because in doing so, you will have a much greater degree of control over the amount of inflammation your physiology experiences. And then B, what are all the other things you can do besides stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system that, can, that controls the amount of inflammation that you, that you have? And that's where like these habits around when you go to bed matters, when you wake up matters, uh, when you eat matters. And all of these things uh, in synchronicity raise your consciousness so you actually start to make better choices in terms of like what you put in your mouth, what you put in your eyes, what you put in your ears, what you put on your skin, uh, what kind of meaning you derive from your daily life and what kind of meaning you, you derive um, and steer your relationships towards. And all of those things just have a dramatic impact on every factor of health. Yeah, and I love distilling it down to inflammation because that one, it takes the, the story away and it really is kind of the, a good universal cue for a lot of health woes, period, mental health or otherwise. Um, but then that, I, I really think of the habits as creating an environment where inflammation can be reduced because when we're creating that structure, creating that environment, we're creating an inner environment so that no matter what's happening outside, there's an inner environment that exists where we can be stimulating the parasympathetic. We can be creating these habits that are bringing down inflammation, which is creating an environment that is more prone towards trust, towards calm, towards whatever it may be that's going to help us um, feel grounded and strong and, and, you know, full of life. Yeah. So let's talk now about, I mean, how much of our mental health is really a conglomerate of the mental health of the people that we're around? <laughs> Right, because one of our one of our core strategies in yoga health coaching is dynamic groups. Like you need, if if you want to change and grow, you you need to be in a group that changes and growing. So it's the business model that we teach in in yoga health coaching. It's the business model we model in all of the courses at Yoga Healer. Like be with people who are oriented towards thrive, who are prioritizing their growth, who understand that who they are can evolve and, and uh, in, in that, that that is accelerated and amplified by being around people that basically have that same intention uh, from the get-go and how hard it might be for people that live in a situation or have chose, and I'm gonna use that word intentionally, we've chose relationships that uh, are basically stagnant uh, and therefore having a hard time getting traction in their mental health. 
Well, or like you were talking about earlier, just um, going to local news sources or going onto social media, you know, just being influenced by just whatever, whatever the collective culture is saying and how that, you know, how that lives versus being influenced by people who are asking these questions and thinking about their lives and thinking about the planet and thinking about how they can make a difference and it's just completely different impact. Yeah. There's even science behind that, right? There's like the science of mirror neurons. So that's the, the same science that makes us yawn when somebody else yawns. Um, our nervous systems are calibrating to the nervous systems around us. And we really don't have a choice. It's happening on such a, a subconscious, like biological level. So it's like what you say, Kate, when we're creating a culture, like we really are marinating in the um, social, emotional environment that we live in. And that's becoming us every moment. And we get to create and choose that. I think is really the important thing here is that like, we, like anyone listening to this has that inbuilt facility. I just want to point how much, um, how we, you know, how we train ourselves to, to be together. Like a lot of that has, we have been trained to, to be together in certain ways and have certain assumptions about that. And a lot of what we do as yoga health coaches is like train a better way. That's much more, um, a realization of what Crystal is, is just shared with that, like, wow, we, we, we have a networked nervous system. So we better, we better acknowledge that and live as if we do, as opposed to the way many of us were educated, which is like, you stay at your desk and you don't talk to her, that's cheating. And you stay over there. And right. And this whole idea that, you know, you're, you are in control of who you are as, a, as an isolated person. Like, that, that's losing a lot of, that's losing a lot of traction. What you do matters, what you choose matters and who you choose to do it with uh, is also just going to have a massive uh, effect on what kind of um, results you then experience in the future. I remember reading early on in my yoga training, like reading a quote that was saying a, a yogic uh, principle that was like, if you want to evolve, hang out with people that are more enlightened than, than you. If you want to stay the same, hang out with people that are the same as you. And if you want to be brought down, hang out with people that are maybe vibrating at a lower level. And I remember being like, that's judgmental. Like I can't, I, I'm doing these practices, so I'm not judging other people, but really understanding that there's a certain level of discernment um, mm -hmm. and that doing these practices helps to strengthen Tejas, Tejas, the fire elements in the energetic body, the fire element in the mind that allows us to discern mm -hmm right company, discern truth. When we're reading that stuff and we're taking things in through social media or news sources, our ability to discern, you know, what is truth. And so um, just the power of right company and what we've all learned from being part of the Yoga Hiller community too, is how quickly you can become elevated just from being in that right company, from being with people that are on the same path and being really clear about what the parameters of that is and the culture that you're trying to create. And I think when I've worked with people or spoken with people about you know, change or Ayurvedic lifestyle, that there tends to be this fear that comes up around, what does it mean to change my life? If I change my life, then I have to lose everything or that I have less than what I had before. And actually recognizing that there is an element of faith that like, if we get into right, if we get into alignment with these, these principles, these practices, if we really do this deep work to heal, that there is, we are orienting towards abundance. And so we're not actually losing anything. We're opening up to abundance. We're opening up to a deeper state of purpose and Dharma. Um, and being in right company has so much to do with our ability to, to shift into that. And, and yeah. right, right company can also just be very personal. It's like, if, if I'm, it's like, know yourself, you know, if I know that I'm going through a period where I'm really feeling the impact of what's going on on the planet, that's going to reinforce who I spend time with or, or where, when I choose to take a break, it's just like, you know, that's such a, an important factor. And we're looking at mental health is understanding like, where am I at right now? Uh, you know, and, and letting that inform what I choose to ingest uh, socially or in other ways. Yeah, yeah, and I just, can, yeah go, go ahead, ahead, Crystal. I was just going to add quickly that it can be a, an impetus for proactive, um, you know, action. Like when you're having some grief about the environment or something, that's when I choose to go out in my garden. And I'm like, look, I'm growing food, you know, and that's, that's my medicine in that moment, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to say to this, like the call to leadership, like for those of you who have been doing yoga for a long time or uh, have 
integrated uh, powers really from from practices that like that's that's the role right that's the the role is is to help lead and to set a standard um, and to raise and to raise the conversation and I find that that is very underdeveloped for some reason uh, as a perspective of like you know I, when I look back and and I know um, and I know I know Shannon just as I know you can definitely relate to this like when you look back to like what's happened over the last 20 30 years in yoga culture um, it, like we have a lot of accumulated wisdom like the, the yoga teachers who have been doing this for decades, it's like we have an enormous amount of accumulated wisdom. And, and I do find a reticence to owning that and directing culture, saying like, oh, I have a responsibility to actually lead. I have a responsibility to direct culture, which means often like calling shit out and having intense conversations and standing for convictions that you know to be true because you've practiced the the practice is in that that is really becomes a pillar, especially for people that are anxious or depressed to be like, oh, that person's like now that I can pin my hope on them because I've lost it in myself. And it's like, a, you know, it's like a maypole and like tethering your ribbon to the maypole and being like that person's the maypole. So now I can do the dance around side of it until I get back in my own orbit and can stand on on my own feet. Yeah, I feel like it like you know, you become a beacon. In Living Ayurveda, it's super practical, it's super down to earth, and we wanted to make a difference in your life, honestly, the moment you start. Hi, it's Kate Stolman, and I'm gonna tell you about how the Living Ayurveda course works and why it works the way it does work. A part of my natural personality is that I'm a futurist. I'm an innovator, I can't help it. It's just the way that my awareness works and has always worked. So I'm always looking at how do we make Ayurveda practical to solve for our biggest problems, to solve for our biggest problems at, at home and nourishing ourselves and getting deep rest and passing on the habits to those who our lives affect. If we understand our habits are truly not our own, we say, hey, whose habits affect me and whose habits am I affecting? And can we align those habits with the kind of radiant longevity that we want to experience, right? Year by year, decade by decade by decade by decade in our road ahead. The other core part of my philosophy is around collective leadership. And I take those two words very seriously. I see how there's a whole next level of open-minded integration where we look at the questions that you're bringing, the conversations you're wanting to have, and we build that into our leadership model, help lead and guide our community in the direction of addressing the deepest, most potent issues that'll help us get the greatest traction in growth and transformational evolution. So that's a lot of, you know, my philosophy on living Ayurveda. I look at our planet. I look at the stresses to our ecosystems, the stresses to our human population, our human culture, and that's what we're solving for. So that's how the, the whole course is geared. I take my community very seriously, become part of my heart, you know, become part of my people, and that's how the course works. I mean, that's why it works too, is it's even though we're all coming in from all over the world, we have an experience of deep connection, deep community, and evolution together. All right, I hope that clarifies some of your questions around the Living Ayurveda course. When I was going through my um, pretty major health crisis when I first went to San Francisco and was just so depleted and like really in deep state of anxiety and depression, I got myself well enough to do a yoga teacher training and someone came in and started teaching about Ayurveda. And I remember she was glowing. <laughs> I totally remember that moment of like, oh my gosh, who is this woman? And, um, and she started speaking about Ayurvedic principles, basic principles, but what, what I was hearing was, this is how I experience life. Like, this is what's inside of me and someone's putting language to that. Mm -hmm. And so this ability to kind of step into leadership and recognize, even if it's not the predominant culture and, and you know, the predominant conversation, that doesn't mean that there aren't people that are, aren't dying for that, that aren't ready for that. And so when we step into leadership, we just have that faith in, in these practices that have been around for thousands of years that are resilient and adaptable in and of themselves. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about mental health and, and the doshas. And I'll just do a, a, you know, just a quick overview of doshas are uh, emanations of energy. So if we have, if there's one universal energy, it, it, it moves into triadic forces or it divides into three and we have the force of movement or vata, which tends to disperse energy, which in mental health uh, can go towards excitement and 
um, ener energization, but on the, on the flip side in a contracted form will go towards anxiety and overwhelm. Uh, nervousness, then anxiety, and then overwhelm, where you have like a, a, a breaking down. Pitta is the energy of transformation. It's fire. Uh, and it's in its positive form in mental health, it gives us focus in, dis in, in that discrimination that Courtney was articulating before, where you can decide this is, this is meaningful and that is not right now for me. And so because of that, I know where to focus because I, I have to focus my attention in, in some direction because if I don't, I'll end up in Vata land where there's just massive diffusion. I'll let my attention go all over the place, which is the energy of movement or, or Vata, but that won't give me, that won't get me to a very specific point um, that, of where I want to go or a very specific experience that I want to be ha having, which in this case could be mental um, stability and very, very positive emotions. So on the flip side of, of Pitta being overly focused, we tend to get uh, very hypercritical uh, and anger and to the extreme, uh, we could say rage or a lot of where we're seeing, you know, people that are raging against other people. So that like that could be, become violence. All right, now Kapha is the energy of, of cohesion. So again, we have movement, we have, we have the energy of transformation, and then we have the energy of cohesion as kapha. And cohesion in mental health, uh, what Courtney was talking about in the beginning with OGIS, this experience of like, I am a cohesed whole, like I, I know me, I have an immune field that protects me from pathogens outside of myself, I know who I am. It gives us the sense of of well-being and all that I was talking about in the parasympathetic nervous system, Kapha gives the feeling of like, I'm all right, it's all right. It might be totally crazy nuts out there, but it's all right. Um, on the negative side, Kapha will become overly cohesive or sluggish or dull, which can lead to uh, like an immobilization of depression where there's just like such a heavy lethargy that there's nothing happening. Um, some people will start with a, a vata or pitta imbalance where they're overly focused. Pitta can go to burnout. Vata can go to extreme anxiety, and they can both mimic kapha. They can both mimic then that, that inability to move uh, and to do and to act. But often uh, it doesn't start with a vata or pitta uh, demonstrating as kapha, it, off, it never started that way. <laughs> it never started from just a lack of activity or a lack of stimulation. All right, so mental health, Ayurveda, and the doshas. What do you guys want to talk about now that I gave my glorious two-minute overview? Yeah, I think, I think it can just be so subtle. Um, you know, like I said, I, I have been on my Ayurveda journey since I was 17, and my symptoms of anxiety and depression started really in childhood. And for a long, long, long time, I thought that I had a vata imbalance and that was kind of the, the end of it. Um, and so I treated myself for vata imbalance, which actually is tremendously helpful, really no matter what imbalance you have, because it is the, it is the, <laughs> it's the, it's the habits, it's the foundation. So it doesn't, you know, it wasn't going down the wrong path. It was still giving me that foundation that I needed. And, you know, over the years through reflection and observation of my behavior, I, I really see that the fundamental kind of energy suck that's happening for me is Pitta. It's very much frustration based, frustration with, you know, either my performance, myself, per frustration with the state of the world sometimes. You know, I was the kind of kid who I picked things up really quickly. And if I got stuck, I got super frustrated with myself. And I can just feel that heat permeate my body. So the vada came from me drying myself out so much <laughs> with frustration, um, lacking all this ojas, lacking the juiciness, and then starting to aggravate the vada. So it took me a long time to really to, to come to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but that lens is such a rich way to work with it. And it's, it's really leading me back to who I am and who I know myself to be when I am cohesive, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and and also who you know yourself to be separate from the doshas which you know usually when we're talking about the doshas we're talking about the doshas in, in aberrant form when they're they're vitiated and 
you know, a lot of time when you're dealing with a mental health issue, you think of your, and, and part of the stigma of mental health and why people have a hard time even admitting that they are having an issue and, and, and getting the help they need is because there is this stigma and this identification with like, I'm this depressed person or I'm this angry person or I'm this anxious person. But when we understand the language of the doshas and the gunas, the qualities, and we can just start to observe you know, how this quality is out of balance. I have a lot of this quality and, and those ebbs and flows. Then it's so much less personal. It's like this thing, like you're saying, you're returning to who you are. You, you are not aberrant or vitiated, right? It's these qualities and we can, you, you know, we can objectify them. We can take care of them. And then we can return to what we are, that, that, that there's no fault to the self, you know, that our core exactly. self. And that's yeah. why that reference point is so vital because we can come to identify with our disease, whether it's depression or whether it's, you know, whatever dosha imbalance, we can come to believe that's who we are. And so going back to that reference point through the habits, through meditation, through the stillness and, and getting that sense of this is balance, this is harmony and having that ability to kind of detect when things are going out is so important. And that, that was so much of what was driving me as this young woman thinking, is this what I am? I'm looking around. This is my family. Is this my destiny? Like I, that seriously was how I was thinking about it. It was terrifying to me. And that, that propelled my search really to, to, till I finally was like, no, you know, found yoga. No, this is not your destiny by any stretch. There's all these things you can do. And that was life-saving for me. Um, just adding on to what Shannon was saying about, you know, the doshas and the gunas, the qualities of the doshas, um, the principle of like increases like opposites balance. And I think right now that's something that I'm speaking to people about a lot because we have so much excess and kind of chaos. We're taking in so much. So as simple as we can get with things, I think that when we balance with that opposite quality of simplicity, and I think also recognizing that once we start to understand ourselves through the nature of uh, the doshas. So if we have this tendency towards high vata, um, what are the qualities of vata? And if those qualities are this mobility, this ungroundedness, um, coldness, how we can start to balance out when we start seeing, okay, I have anxiety coming up in my mind. I know vata is aggravated by these qualities of excess movement, of coldness, of lightness, of, you know, dryness. So what are the basic things that I can do right in this moment to pacify my mind? to recognize that I have things that I can do with my physical body. I can have a nice warm bowl of soup or do an oil massage or really just rest and not take anything more into my senses that we become really empowered to understand our own physiology and work through it so that we can see that this is just a, um, a situation of imbalance of excess right now, but this is not my true self. This is not who I am. And I'm actually empowered to create balance in my own life. Yeah. I I want to highlight that, like just even in the, even in the pause of what am I experiencing? What is just what you're speaking both to, to the, to the gunas, like how guna just means an adjective or descriptor, like how would I describe it? Because now I'm not that. Now I'm the one who's, who's describing, oh, my heart's beating fast. Oh, my breath is, seems to be stopping uh, around my <laughs> upper chest or nipple line. Oh, uh, my hands are cold. Oh, my armpits are sweating. So who am I is not this physiological response. And then there's a, just in terms of like how we can, how we can get out of a panic attack essentially, uh, or a depression moment uh, or a hypercritical resistance to whatever is, right? An emotional resistance to whatever it is, is A, just recognizing like, oh, this is an emotional habit trigger this is another thing we do in yoga health coaching and we memorize what the habit triggers are and we teach our members how to notice. And, and emotions are a habit trigger. I would say if, if, uh, if, if we were to take it one step further for those who study yoga, thoughts are a habit trigger. They're just harder for most people to recognize. <laughs> emotions are easy. I'm pissed off. Okay, that's a habit trigger. Or I'm scared. These men in front of me are fighting. Okay, that's a habit trigger. Now, what to me is so important about this is then the exhale, right? Like, okay, that's what's happening now. So I can still relax and notice that I am in an emotional habit trigger or my habit is my, my emotional body is, is in uh, a triggered response is to, is to then just ask the question, like, how did it get here? 
And because that's when we can start to put cause and effect into account. And that's where like when we began this conversation about choice, because that was something that came up right off the bat was like, oh, we get to choose. We get to choose the habits came up later in the conversation. We get to choose who we spend time with. And many of you might be in denial of that. Like if you hang out with us, you'll figure out how to do that. <laughs> like you really do get to choose. Uh, to then like, oh, I get to choose to figure out what generated this right now what generated this experience that I'm having right now. And if there's anything I can do to, to change or, or maybe run short experiments, small experiments to create a potentially different outcome, now I'm in a position of power, which is a positive motion in itself. So I've used the negative emotion to pause, to exhale, to feel, feel what's going on in my physiology, to start to identify hot, cold, sharp, dull, cloudy, clear, inside, outside, top, bottom, like where, right? Like I'm just describing what's happening where. So now I'm no longer that. And then I'm looking back and saying, what created this? What created this? And then what created this that I have control over? And what I'm finding more and more in coaching binding is people are starting to put it together. of like, oh, I picked up my phone. Oh, I don't have my notifications turned off, which means I have my notifications turned on because that's the default mode. Oh, that caused me to look at this. I looked at this and then I got scared. And then I had this feeling of anxiety five minutes later. And I just also wanted to add to that is like when someone's in the, the grips of anxiety or depression, yeah. the idea of making a choice may feel like just a mountain to climb. And, and it doesn't have to be a huge choice or a huge shift that you're making. It could be just the simplest thing like just going to turn off my notifications or, you know, whatever the smallest thing that, that idea of Kaizen, small, gradual change, because it can feel very overwhelming when someone's really in the depths of that, but really just having the wisdom to just take a look at it, you know, could be the, the choice point that you're making in that moment. Yeah. And, and also in the grips of anxiety, that's probably not the time you're going to be tracking back in any kind of clear way. Like where, where did this come from? Uh, but later, certainly once you've calmed down, that, it, that would be a, an intelligent thing to do would be to, so, so that you can prevent <laughs> the, the future arising of that same thing. But yeah, just any small action that you can take, like Kate's saying, just the exhale and just mm -hmm. feeling your feet on the ground and just right beginning to identify what's happening in this organism that I am, but I'm also in, in some ways... Um, maybe I'm detached from and I need to just get in here a little bit more. <laughs> and that's too why I think the keystone habit can be so vital because when you are in the grips of something really difficult and you don't know up from down, you just go back to that one habit and that's your, you know, go back to basics, start from scratch, just build from there. And that's all you have to do, you know, that one thing. And then once that starts giving you some momentum, you can add another thing and another thing, but having that keystone habit to fall back on can be so powerful. Yeah. Powerful and empowering. Mm -hmm. So I want to end with just a, a brief conversation on pharmaceuticals for anxiety and depression and where they interface with habits and, and Ayurveda. Um, there's at least, you know, for, I think for some of us who really went hardcore into holistic medicine, as opposed to complementary medicine or allopathic medicine, uh, that there's a stigma there is, a, there is, and there's also, uh, I would say a, a probably a more developed understanding of the toxicology of pharmaceuticals so that it's like side effects means that something is happening that's really not good for the entire organism. Uh, Buildup of side effects over time is something that is real. Anyone who comes from more of an Ayurveda or detox background uh, knows that like it's, it's pretty hard to detox pharmaceuticals from the physiology. Uh, they tend to be really hot uh, and it can, be, it, 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 it can be hard. It can be easy to get on a drug. It can be hard to get off a drug. So it's, it's not without, I would say, you know, some deep knowledge that there's, that there is a bit of a, of a, a stigma, uh, but it's also a different, totally different scope of practice. I would say in India, it's much more integrated in when people get a, uh, an MD in, in Ayurveda, um, and they also have a totally different use of, of Ayurvedic pharmaceuticals 
um, in India. So if we just go to most, you know, most Westerners uh, or people that ha are raised more in an allopathic culture who are used to the pill and the bill, or you have a, you have a problem with anxiety or depression and you get a prescription for that, there's not a very, there's not often when the prescription is given much of a discussion of long-term toxicology or side effects uh, or how hard it might be to, to then get off the drug, et cetera. And with, I would say, holistic practitioners in yoga and in Ayurveda, uh, there's a bit often more of an awareness of that, that it can be really hard. Uh, and, and yet it also can be totally necessary, right, to work in the field of complementary medicine where you're working both with your habits and your culture, like we've already discussed and, and understanding all the things that we just discussed around, like you can do a lot, you can do a lot on your own. So when we need, you know, when, when that's not working or when we don't actually have the bandwidth to be able to do that, to be able to, to change our habits when, when a drug might save someone uh, and the necessity of complementary medicine that's both working with you know, habits on one hand and, uh, and pharmaceuticals on the other in an integrated way. I, my feeling is that if the goal is to really get this person to a state of health, to look at their lifestyle and look at what they have the power to do every day is if that's being used in conjunction with medication, then that is, and if that person's already on medication or it's necessary in that, in that moment, that's how we're really going to get people to those deep results because we're not looking at the really the whole picture. We're not working with the whole toolkit if we're not working with what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how they're influencing their physiology and their mind and their emotions. And I think there's a whole spectrum. Absolutely, there are um, moments where that stability is necessary in order for that person to move forward and just get grounded. But I do think there's also a piece of um, how can we just sit with and digest emotions that are a natural part of human existence. You know, we go through traumas, we go through experiences. And can we be in a place of comfort with the discomfort and allow ourselves to just experience those? And so I would just, you know, what I encourage is um, kind of truth around that and acceptance around that rather than the belief that like, this is an emotion that comes up and it's uncomfortable. This is a state of mind, it's uncomfortable. And then we go straight to this step rather than all the steps in between including being able to sit with and digest and experience and breathe through the discomfort of emotion, which can be a gateway to evolution and transformation as well. So I think that there's a bigger conversation around like the many steps that lead up to having to, you know, leading up to actually needing to be on medication. And there's so many things that can be done before getting to that place. And I just wish that the conversation, the more mainstream conversation could really look at that because the goal is to get people to results, to get people to health and wellness, to get people to stability um, and to allow, give them the tools to work with their own trauma and their own challenges. Well said. And if, and if there is like, you know, and, like, and if one is already on medication, like really looking at how to develop the holistic, cause I, I can, I heard that in, in both things that you said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the everyday behaviors, what we're eating, uh, who we're spending time with, all these things we've been talking about. I mean, th those are definitely um, going to be helpful. So for, for somebody who's, who's gone on medication for debilitating anxiety or depression, and that's been maybe a lifesaver for them to also know that they can come into this work and uh, start to really, rec you know, see uh, how the learning dinacharya, learning the habits of, of healthy living uh, can, can help. I mean, everybody that I've helped uh, in my courses who's been on medication, usually the medication isn't something we go after, but it's often something that falls away uh, over the course of time, over the course of like this step-by-step-by-step -step -step process that Courtney was talking about. So, um, you know, that it's totally possible for these two worlds to work together. And, it, and the bigger issue, as Courtney was describing, of, you know, just understanding in Western culture that, yeah, we're emotional beings. <laughs> we feel things. And we may not have had any training. We may, and we may not have a family that is functional on that level. We may never have seen how to just let emotions 
you know, how, how to live in, in, you know, with emotion. So we need training. We need to talk about that. We need to understand that, yeah, we're going to feel anxious sometime. We're going to feel depressed. We're going to feel sad. We're going to feel all kinds of things, joyful, happy. And, you know, that, that's the fundamental training we all need help with. And then some of us have propensities to feel more deeply, you know, or some of us have lived through trauma, et cetera. And, you know, we may need a little bit more support on that level, just like we might need more support on the level of our skin or our digestion or any number of things. Yeah. I also think it's really important in the wellness world as someone who has been um, guilty of being a bit black and white, a bit of a, uh, of a purist in the past about, okay, this is what I will put in my body. This is what I won't, you know? Um, and, you know, kind of the, that dichotomy of good and bad, I've really come to see everything as existing on a spectrum rather than, you know, two polarized categories. Um, and see, you know, even our meditation is a tool that we use um, for wellness. Even our, you know, our habits, our health, our food, our medicine, our pharmaceuticals, if we do go that route, everything sort of exists on a spectrum. And really fundamentally for me, what it comes down to is that reference point. So if someone's in need of a reference point, there may be people who've never had a reference point in their entire lives and going on medication gives them that reference point for the first time. Like what does it actually feel like to feel okay, to feel like good in my body, to feel in balance. Um, and that reference point is ultimately going back to who we really are. So you know, if something's happening on a chemical level in the body and it needs to be addressed, by all means, address it. And once that happens, the, the, the consciousness is unaffected, ultimately. Consciousness is not touched by those things, by, by chemicals, even by our food, to some extent, we could argue, which is, you know, a bit esoteric, but yeah, we could argue that. Um, so Conscious, I'm just going to say consciousness isn't affected by our ability to experience ourselves as consciousness is definitely affected. Sorry, say it again. I would say consciousness itself is not affected within us, but our ability to access ourselves as consciousness is affected, is affected by the vibration of pharmaceuticals. And that's, and that's the, and I think that's the, the reason uh, that this is so, uh, you know, that, that, that pharmaceuticals are, are, are very, I would say, respected in alternative medicine uh, because of that, because mm. there, there is so much to understanding law of vibration in, in any form of holistic medicine and understanding to the vibration of pharmaceuticals is also, I would say, better understood by often holistic practitioners than the allopathic doctors that prescribe them. Yeah, well, that's absolutely and true. Pharmaceuticals for mental health, I think, basically either turn something up or they turn something down. I mean, that's how I've had a neuroscientist explain it to me. And, that, and that's, then that's getting to Kate's point exactly, because if, if what we're doing is turning something down to get, to get that ground or that stability, uh, then, yeah, that's going to turn everything down, not just, you know, whatever that um, imbalance was that was causing so much distress. I mean, that's the problem. It doesn't just target the one little thing <laughs> that needs turning down. It targets many things or turning up. So, you know, that's where uh, what we're doing is so much more specific. You know, we're, we're working with the very particular qualities. And, you know, we also recognize that a medicine that brings in a side effect mm, is, I mean, in Ayurveda, that it wouldn't even be considered a medicine because if it's, if it's taking care of a problem, but creating three more problems, that's a problem. <laughs> right. uh, that being said, uh, there's room for everything. There's room for everything. And there's, you know, we don't, we don't always have access to all the whole story. Uh, when we're just starting out, we just know we feel crummy and we want to feel better and we, and we go for what's available. Um, but just to recognize there's a whole, there's a whole journey that, that we can take with other people that are looking towards, you know, living the most vibrant life that they can in touch with themselves in the deepest level possible. And that, you know, you don't have to stop with just feeling a, a little bit better <laughs> in your body. There's a whole long journey um, more than that possible for everybody. Yeah. And then it doesn't shut any doors, you know, that, that there's, that door is always open. You can always revisit it when it's time. Yeah. Well said. Well, I so enjoyed this conversation. I know on Facebook, there's, um, 
because we stream this and it, and it and I know many old people will be listening to it as a podcast. There's just a few questions around books. Uh, the, the first book that I recommend to is was Kate O'Donnell's uh, Ayurveda for Self Care, uh, and then and then Body Thrive, which is the habits that the, the habit book that I wrote, Up Level Your Habits in Your Life. Uh, your body and your life with the 10 habits of yoga and Ayurveda, which really gets into what we were talking about in the beginning and that there's, that there's habits to align to. Uh, and I also just want to throw master of you in there because what I find, which is my more recent book is if people are living a life of meaning often that uh, in, in, in a life of habits, it's <laughs> like a lot of mental health stuff goes away uh, because when we're, when we're working a job, we don't want to work or we're in, uh, spending our time in a way that isn't aligned to a life of deeper meaning, that will create a lot of anxiety, irritation, and depression in itself. Uh, and, and to move even more in that direction, two other books that are like that are Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules of Life, which really helps uh, anyone develop why uh, the scientific importance of a life of meeting uh, and the history of that, of, of people living a life of meaning or having a noble aim. Uh, and then designing your life by uh, by Bill Burnett uh, out of Stanford is also just excellent for understanding the connection of yourself as the creator of your life and the importance of that in your in your mental health. So I know I just rattle off a ton of books. We'll put them all in the show notes um, and in the Facebook thread for that. I'd love to add one actually. Um, yeah. it's it's called Dialogue with Death, and it's a commentary on the Katha Upanishad by Iknath Esaran. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Iknath Esaran. It's a really, really deep, profound view of depression through that Upanishad and and through kind of the sense gates, and it's really, really, um, really gave a lot to me in in that lens. So I'd love to recommend that. Thanks, Crystal. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. Again, this was uh, Kate Stillman with Shannon McCall, Courtney LaCava, and Crystal Hosha, all uh, of which I've met through Yoga Health Coaching. Thanks you all, thank you all for, for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This is great.